Take your Bible and turn with me to the book of 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 1, I'm going to be reading verses 3 through 11. And my thoughts today are going to center around this one statement. It does matter what you believe. My wife and I had the opportunity to fly to London, England. Our daughter was doing mission work. At, a, uh, at some of the colleges in Paris. And so she agreed to meet us in England where we could read the signs at the airport and that she would see us over to France and she was our, she was our interpreter that got us through everything. But uh, when we got there in, in London, uh, of course, jet lagged. Uh, we we were not, didn't worry at all about our wits, but even after a day or two of rest, we were walking down the street. We came up to a, a, a crosswalk across a, a lane of traffic, and I was fixing to just walk across it because, you know, I looked down to the right, and I didn't see anybody coming. It was a single lane, and I thought, well, there's nobody coming. And my wife said, don't go, because coming out of my left side, you see, I, I'm of the belief that people are supposed to drive on the right side of the road. Well, you know what? That works here, <laughs> but it doesn't work there, you see. I remember as a teenager thinking to myself, I actually believed it. Well, they don't mind if I drive 10 miles over the speed limit. Well, I found out that I believed wrongly, and I had an opportunity to, 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 de, uh, to donate to the county uh, there a, a certain sum of money and so that I would never forget that what I believed was wrong. You're supposed to drive within the speed limit. And so you see, what you believe makes a difference. Follow with me. Verse 3. We read Paul's greeting to Timothy. He said, As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that would be uh, what we would call Greece today, that you might charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Don't miss that phrase. Teach no other doctrine, neither to give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which minister questions rather than godly building up, edifying, which is in the faith, so do. Now, the goal or the end of the commandment is love, charity, out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfaked. That's what unfeigned means. You're not faking it. Uh, from, from which some, having swerved, they've gone off course, they have turned aside unto empty noise, vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind. By the way, in case somebody tells you that homosexuality is not condemned in the Bible, this next phrase is the Greek, the Greek equivalent of of homosexuality, those who defile themselves with mankind. If you read the Greek, it's, that's what it, it's, it's there. Please don't, don't, I mean, that doesn't mean we condemn one sin greater than the other, but let us call sin, sin, and righteousness, righteousness, and that's, let God be praised. And if there be, uh, oh, excuse me, for uh, men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing which is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. Okay. It does matter what you believe. And Paul is reminding Timothy, this is the reason. I've asked you to stay there in uh, Ephesus because I've got to move on, but somebody's got to Run herd on the herd. Somebody's got to be there to keep the flock where it belongs to be. Belief equals action. You might say, well, you just believe that. That's okay. You can believe anything you want to. No, you can't believe anything you want to. You can get run over. You can pay speeding tickets. You can do things that have worse consequences. People say, oh, I, can, I could take... 
10, 10 of those pills, it won't hurt me. And when they're pumping their stomach at the hospital and they barely survive, they realize you can't just believe what you want to believe. Now, we, we say, well, yeah, in, in, in material and concrete things, maybe that's not so complicated, but when it gets to these uh, mystical things, these spiritual issues, they are just as important. They are just as dangerous or they are just as full of blessing as they can be. It does matter what you believe. In Proverbs chapter 23 and verse seven, it says plainly, as a person thinks in their heart, so are they. As he thinks in his heart, so is he. It does make a difference what you believe. Do you know that there are entire states a part of our country that mandate the teaching of gender confusion. They mandate it. And if you as a parent interfere, if you as a teacher balk against it, they will toss you out on your ear. Talk to Rosa. Uh, she had to take Michael home. He wasn't feeling well, but uh, talk to Rosa about one of her uh, family members in California and how she is under uh, a suspicion and being watched by the authorities because she doesn't want her children to be taught things that are not true, that are contrary to her faith. We have states that believe different things. You say, oh, it doesn't matter. Yeah, it does. It does to her. It does to a lot of people. Some of our nation's largest cities have stated policy now. It went from things that they believe to stated policy that resembles anarchy. No rules, no punishment, no bail, nothing but crime in the streets. Every man does what's right in his own eyes. It does matter what you believe. There are large segments of our population in the 21st century that believe that a God, with a little g, is whatever you want it to be. You know what? Why would you want to put your life in the hands of some deceived little demigod that hasn't got the power to do you any good at all? You know, there are many voices in this world. And understand me, there is the voice of the Holy, Holy, Holy Spirit of God who speaks the truth. And then there are other spirits who speak nothing but lies with the intention of convincing you to go on and believe the lie. It won't hurt you. Satan was there in the serpent with Eve and said, it'll make you wise. It looks like it tastes good. God is holding out on you. And she believed it. And so since then, every single human being, with two exceptions, have died. And many have gone out into a Christless eternity. It does make a difference what you believe. And so Paul charged Timothy, you make sure that nobody comes into the church to teach any other doctrine. Now, this is the city of Ephesus. There are plenty of heathen temples down the street. They are worshiping idols. They are practicing immoral behavior, and they're calling it worship. There's, Ephesus is a city in which anything goes. But Paul said in the church of God, Timothy, don't you let anybody teach any other doctrine because it makes a difference what you choose to believe. Paul said in the sixth chapter of the book of Romans, whatever you submit yourself to, you might think it's harmless, but he says, whatever you submit yourself to, you will become its servant, its slave. You can be the free servant of righteousness, or you can be the bond slave of evil. What you believe makes a difference. Now, some people say, oh, doctrine. I don't care what kind of doctrine the church has. They got great coffee and great music. And, and some young people say, and hot chicks. That's how they choose their church. I had a guy tell me that. They got hotter chicks and hotter music, man. That's where I go. Doctrine, doctrine does, uh, listen. Can I tell you what doctrine is? Do you know what doctrine is? 
A doctrine is what you believe. You ever heard of the Monroe Doctrine? It shaped uh, this nation in its early years. You ever heard of the, the uh, MacArthur Doctrine? That was what uh, brought, uh, rebuilt Japan after the Second World War. A doctrine is a body of information. The things that you have settled on, this is what we believe. This is what we're going to practice. Now, Paul said, Timothy, brother, I've been spending 15 years giving you the right doctrine. You've been under my wing. I've discipled you. Your mama and your grandmama taught you the Old Testament scriptures, and I've been teaching you Jesus. And so you have the body of doctrine. And when I came to Ephesus, I planted churches in Ephesus, and I gave them the right doctrine. You need to stay there and make sure that each generation in that church passes on the truth to the next generation. Because why? Say it. Because it does matter what you believe. It does matter what you believe. So don't let anybody teach anything that is contrary, verse 10, contrary to sound doctrine. Now, the church in Ephesus at this time in its history, it's been uh, planted, it's been founded. They have already begun to select leaders. They are having small groups and large groups. They are worshiping, they are teaching, they are evangelizing, they're discipling, uh, they're doing benevolence in the community. But they are now experiencing doctrinal drift. Jesus wrote to the church in Ephesus, in the second chapter of the book of Revelation. He said, John, write write this down and take it to the church in Ephesus. They started out with sound doctrine, but they began to lose their first love. That's a bad place to go. When you fall out of love with Jesus, guess what? You're going to love something else. Matter of fact, in most people's cases, they stopped loving Jesus because they started loving something else. You see, Jesus said it clearly, you can't serve two masters. You're either going to love one and hate the other, or you're going to cling to one and despise the other. You can't serve two masters. And so it is true of your heart. You have a first love, and then everything else falls beneath that. And so Paul said, Timothy, Part of loving God is knowing who he is, so doctrine is important. You're not going to love God unless you know who he is, and that's what doctrine is about. The doctrine of creation, the doctrine of the, the law of Moses, the doctrine of salvation, these are essential things. Anybody ever go into a chemistry lab and say, hey, teach, can I mix these things together and see what happens? I've never seen a chemistry teacher yet say, yeah, go ahead, let's see what happens. Y'all watch this. Uh Uh-uh. You don't pull that sodium out of that vial of oil that it's kept in because if you pull that sodium out and it uh, contacts oxygen anywhere, uh, they're going to have to call the fire department. That room's going to go boom. You see, in the physical world, there are limitations. There are doctrines of fact and, and what is true science, and I'm not talking about this junk that they're teaching for science. True science is measurable, provable, and repeatable. You do it seven or 800 times, you say, okay, every time A plus B goes together, it, it's equal C. It's going to happen. And so in the physical world, we say, yeah. Gravity works every time you jump off a cliff. You're only going to have a few seconds to tell God how sorry you are that you did such a stupid thing. You see, in the spiritual realm, doctrine is even more important because what you do with the physical things, it's only going to affect your short mortal life. You're going to die anyway. That's why they call us mortal. We're death doomed. We're headed that way. But man, you mess up with your doctrine in the spiritual and it's going to affect you forever and ever and ever. And so as this church was beginning to experience doctrinal drift, like the teacher in Hebrews uh, wrote in chapter 2 and verse 1, therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. Don't let them slip, man. Drifting is the worst thing in the world. Now understand this. Because the devil is an accomplished liar... 
people will believe almost anything. People will sell themselves to almost anything because the devil is the original con artist and he will con you into something that will do what? What is his agenda? Steal, kill, and destroy. By the way, just for counterpoint, what did Jesus come to do? He came that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly. Steal, kill, and destroy life and abundant life. Hmm, which one should I choose? Our doctrine will determine whether we know which one is which. And because the devil is such a liar, people can be taken in by all kinds of stuff. So they had people who came into the church, maybe believers, not maybe not believers, but they were people, as Paul said, they were teaching fables. You know what a fable is? It, it's an ain't true story. And endless genealogies. Well, are you a descendant of, of uh, Benjamin? Are you, you know, and, and they get, you know, the Bible says how not to get saved in John chapter one. And it says we are not saved by blood. We are not saved by the will of a man or we're not saved by the will of a group of people. That's how not to get saved. You're not gonna get saved based on who your kinfolk are. Now, you might get a job based on who your kinfolk are, if they've got a good name in town, or if a lot of people owe your kinfolk money, you might get a job just so they could curry favor, but it doesn't work that way with God. Now, yes, the priesthood of Israel, they were supposed to be of a certain lineage, but the Bible didn't say that you had to be of the bloodline of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to be saved. They, God made provision for what you call a proselyte. As a matter of fact, the Jewish people were supposed to be going out showing the world how great their God was. Y'all come join us as a Gentile and you can be part of the household of faith without even being related to us by a single drop of blood. By the way, we're all related in Adam and in Noah. One human race. But you see, they were teaching these endless genealogies. Man, you gotta, you gotta have a pedigree to be saved. And Paul said that this ministers questions rather than godly edifying. It doesn't build anybody up. It just makes a bunch of questions and people are scratching their head wondering and they go off into confusion. But godly edifying is in the faith. The, one, the faith once delivered unto man. The faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. Today we have churches and whole denominations that have been subverted by teachings that were clearly heresy just a decade ago. They're preaching stuff from their pulpits, if they ever preach, that just 10 years ago they said, oh, that's heresy, we can't go there. Oh, but the culture has changed. Well, then we'll just change with the culture. And that's why Paul said, Timothy, somebody's got to be that unpopular person by the way, I, I, I didn't have any uh, misconceptions about what it meant to be a Baptist preacher. My best friend was a Baptist preacher. He was like a father to me in the faith, and he helped me grow up and helped me learn how to take care of my family and keep a job and, and do the right thing in the community. He, he discipled me, and, and, and I went with him, and I heard the stuff that people told him and the way that people treated him and <laughs> some of those deacons' meetings that he dragged himself out of bruised and bloodied. I didn't have the opinion that to be a Baptist preacher is, is a popular position to take. And I guess that's helped me. I've never been deceived into thinking that such a thing is true. And when Paul commissioned Timothy to stand there and say, thus saith the Lord, we don't move to the right and we don't move to the left. We don't go over it. We don't go under it. We stick with the stuff. Amen? And sometimes that's popular a little bit. Most of the time, it's not. And so he says, you need to be there. There is a need in every church, in every age, for leaders to challenge the idea that truth and doctrine must evolve. Please understand me when I say this. Truth does not change. I mean, open your dictionary. Go Google it. Even Google knows that truth is something 
that is absolutely true and it always was true and it will always be true as long as the world stands. Truth is truth. And so if it can change, it's not truth. And so some people, especially young people, they get frustrated when the preacher says, well, look, this is what Abraham taught. This is what Isaac, Jacob, David, Elijah, Paul, Matthew, Timothy, John. This is what God took the trouble to reveal. What God went to the trouble of both inspiring and preserving uh, now for a period of about uh, three and a half, four thousand years, we've had portions of this book. And God says, don't add to it. Don't take away from it. Don't Forget it when it's convenient, but stay by the stuff. The old saying in the Old Testament, do not move the ancient landmark. It had something to do with the uh, inheritance that God gave to the 12 tribes of Israel, but the principle applies to the word of God. God staked out landmarks. This is right. This is wrong. Now listen, that doesn't mean if somebody's wrong that we hate them. Maybe the church of Jesus has done a really poor job of loving people who are doing wrong. Jesus said, love your enemies. Jesus said, pray for them. And maybe we need to understand that it's not our place. It is not love to try to change the truth to accommodate people's chosen lifestyle. Now understand me, it's uncomfortable, it's inconvenient when your neighbors hold different opinions when things that are clearly revealed in Scripture. That doesn't mean you have to stop loving them, but it does mean that you don't alter the truth to become popular. Every one of us had that trouble in high school. Anybody go through high school not caring where anybody liked them or not? Yeah, you had homeschool. Yeah, you just be quiet. You know what? He's not eat, eat up with it. But Zach likes to be liked. Brother Ray likes to be liked. Everybody likes to be liked. And, and it's not wrong to want to be liked. We like to connect with people. We like to feel like we're a part of one another, that we're brethren in the Lord. But... You can't make friends by trying to change stuff that God said doesn't change. And that's what Timothy's job was. <laughs> and I can imagine, I don't know if Timothy was married or not, but I can imagine when he went home that day, he got this letter, he took it home to read it to his wife, and he said, thanks a lot, Paul. <laughs> I'm not going to have fun here. <laughs> Because, I mean, a fledgling church, can you imagine all the, the winds of doctrine that were blowing around there? I mean, they, they were, most of those new believers were total pagans. Now, there were a lot of Jews that came out of Judaism into Christianity, but then those are the ones that Paul was uh, telling Timothy, these are the ones you're going to have the most problems with because they're teaching all this endless genealogy and all this law stuff. All right, principles. If it can change, it's not the truth. Second principle. God does not change. Does anybody under, not understand that? The Lord made it very clear. He made a public statement on it. He didn't even leave it to the press secretary. He said it himself. He said, I am the Lord. I change not. Does anybody have an idea why God doesn't change? Because he's God, and that means he's what? Perfect. He's perfect. Anybody here perfect? Now, now, Felicia's in perfect health back there, but that's a good, that, you know, that's good. That's, but even that's relative perfection. I mean, we're, none of us are 18 anymore, right? You know, we're not, we're, that, was, that was perfect. Anyway, um, God is perfect. That's why he doesn't have to change. Listen to me. God is right. And he's always right. So why would he change? He'd have to be wrong if he changed. Do you want God to be wrong? You want him to become as dumb and selfish as you are? Oh, no. God, you just stay the same and help me to become like you, you see. 
2 Timothy 3.16. We'll, we'll spend some time in that. There are four things that the Scripture provides. Uh, Paul told Timothy, all Scripture, every bit of it, all of it, is given by inspiration of God. It's God-breathed, and it is profitable for four things. Doctrine. See there? Doctrine. God gave the Bible for doctrine. Doctrine is what you believe. It's what you live by. It's what you make your decisions by. You say, well, I don't have a whole lot of doctrine. Well, you better have some. Or else you're just going to be a flag in the wind. You'll blow every way the breeze is blowing. Reproof. That's to tell you when you're wrong. Correction. That's to tell you how to get right again. And then instruction in righteousness to tell you, I like to say it this way, doctrine is to tell you which highway you're supposed to be on. Reproof is to tell you when you're gone off on the wrong street. Correction is to tell you how to get back on the highway. And instruction is to tell you how to stay on the highway, you see. And that's what the Word of God is for. And it really covers everything. Everything that's pertinent to life and godliness is found in the Word of God. And there were those people in the church in Ephesus who were trying to blend old, dead, Pharisaical Judaism with Christianity. They were teaching, and I'm going to give you a definition here. You, you, you want to remember this. They were teaching legalism. Now, a lot of times when Christian people say, well, I don't drink because it doesn't please God, they say, oh, you're a legalist. Or, you know, I don't, I, I don't buy lottery tickets because it wouldn't please God. Well, you're a legalist. No. Legalism is the idea that something other than Jesus can get you saved or keep you saved. So, well, that sounds bad because according to the Bible, Jesus is the only Savior. He's the way, truth, and life. Nobody gets the Father except by Him. He's exclusive. He said, I am the, the definite article, the, I am the door. I am the way, the truth, the life. I'm it. But legalism is the idea that, quote, by doing good works or by obeying law, a person earns or merits salvation. That's legalism. And maybe a, an exponent of that would be, it is a system of belief that suggests a believer must obey God and his laws, ergo the Ten Commandments, as a prerequisite to receiving his grace and salvation. Man, if I had to keep the law before I got saved, I'd still be lost. Paul said, yeah, you know that one about covetous. He said, that's, that's the one that got me. He said, I, was, I thought I was alive, but then the law, the law came and said, you dead, son. You're a covetous man. He said, yep, I'm guilty. That's how he came to faith, because he said, who shall save me from the body of this death? I can't keep the law. I can see that I've clearly failed. What do I do? He said, I thank my God through Jesus Christ. You see, that's how salvation comes. And so Paul explained to Timothy, verse 7, these folks are desiring to be teachers of the law. They don't understand what they're saying. They don't know what they're affirming. And then Paul goes on to say, you know, well, now here's, here's what the law does. This is what the law was sent for. There was a reason for the law. Have you ever heard uh, Paul talk about the law was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ? And the word schoolmaster doesn't really mean teacher. It means a servant who takes a kid by the hand and walks them safely to school so the teacher can teach them. The law is that servant that brings us to the teacher. Who's he? Jesus. And Jesus gives us salvation. But you see, they, they um, Paul says, let, let's read what he said. This is good. But we, of course it's good, it's in scripture. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. Use it the way it was sent. Now, he explains some of that in just a couple verses. It won't take much time. Let's look at it. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man. Now, understand me. Righteous people can benefit from it. Certainly, uh, God told a righteous man, Joshua, to meditate in the law day and night, that he may observe to do all that's written therein, for then you'll make your way prosperous, and then you'll have good success. That was a promise given. Meditating in the law is a good thing. It reminds you, these are things that God loves. These are things God hates. Let's be sure we choose the right one. But the law was not given for righteous people to somehow earn some merit with God. There's no brownie point system with God. There's nothing but a race, a human race of fallen, guilty, condemned sinners 
who are absolute beggars and have nothing to their account, and they come to one who is willing to give them the gift of salvation. As the song goes, no merit of my own I claim. And so you see, the law has its place, but it's primarily, notice what Paul says, the next word, but for the lawless and disobedient. I think it was rather convenient. In, in the first year, as God began to deal with me and brought me to salvation from August of 1972 until August of 1973, God was trying to bring me to Jesus. And I found myself in the Old Testament reading those laws and rules, and I realized... I broke that one, I broke that one, I broke that one. What am I gonna do? You see, as a, as a good old evangelist once used to say, you gotta get a man lost before you can get him saved. You gotta realize, a person's gotta realize, I'm bad. You can't just come to God and say, well, I'm pretty good, you wanna help me to be gooder? I'll work hard, I'll earn it, God, I'll earn it. No, don't, don't laugh at that because you've done that. You've done that. I mean, in your heart, you've, well, I've done really good. God really liked it. No, he's pleased when you want to please him, but you're not earning anything. The fact of the matter is, some of us have been down the pike a few years. We realize that there's nothing good in me except what he is doing and has done. It's all him. I fully believe that for every person who is faithful, truly faithful, save people who are faithful, that there's going to be a crown, a reward given to them. And I fully believe that every last one of them are going to take those crowns off their head and they're going to lay them down at Jesus' feet and say, it's all you. It's all you. It's none of me. But I am so grateful you let me be a part of it, you see. Now that's, well, that's another subject. So it's the law is given for the lawless and disobedient, for ungodly and for sinners, and he lists the whole rogues gallery uh, and anything else that's contrary to sound doctrine. Skip over to verse 5 real quickly. I want to wrap this up. What is the purpose of the commandment? And, and Paul states that plainly in verse 5. Look at it. He says the end, and that means if you, if you go to somebody's farm, a ranch. Most of the time, you'll go down a highway and then you'll turn in at some real fancy gate and you'll go down a long road. And when you get to the end of the road, you're at the farm. You're at the farmhouse or the barn or whatever. You see, the, 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 when he says the end of the law, he's talking about the goal of the law. What's at the end of the road? The thing you're after, it's at the end of the road. The end of the road for the commandment is love. Charity, out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. So he says, you see, the law is just to get you in, in uh, touch with Jesus, to get you in fellowship with Jesus, to get you to abide in Jesus, and he's going to fill you with his love. And this is, the law is just to bring you to him. And also to remind you, if you get out of the path somewhere, he'll remind you, oh, you're off course, you're on a dead end street, come on, get back on the right road. The goal of the law is to bring people to Jesus and to bring them to the place they receive him, believe him, and become his. And he fills them with his love. Matter of fact, in another place, the Bible declares that love is the fulfilling of the law. That, you know, don't steal, don't kill, don't commit adultery. You wouldn't do those things if you love God and love people. You wouldn't be covetous and greedy over other people's stuff if you love Jesus and loved other people. You see, it's all about God transforming us, working at us from within. And so Paul said, Timothy, you're going to have these folks teaching this dead religion. Did you know that the sect of the Pharisees died out in the first century? There are no more Pharisees. And there's nobody that wants to say, well, my ancestor was a Pharisee. Nobody, nobody claims that. They got a bad rap because they were purveyors of a bad doctrine. They were the worst of the worst of legalists. And I'm not advocating unholy living. Mind you, you love Jesus, you're going to live holy. God said, be holy because I'm holy. 
If you stay in fellowship with him, he'll infuse you with his righteousness. He'll infuse you with his wisdom. He'll infuse you with his love. And you'll walk the path and you'll look in there and you'll say, well, you, what do you know? I'm not lying. I'm not stealing. I'm not committing adultery. I'm not coveting. I'm not taking the name of the Lord in vain. What do you know? I thought I was just loving Jesus. You see, that's the new life. That's the born again experience. That's the process of sanctification. But if you take it the other way and you teach people, well, here's the laws, you gotta keep the laws, and you're gonna have people out there straining and judging one another and throwing stones at one another and being hateful to one another. And so Paul said, Timothy, don't let anybody teach that stuff in the church of Ephesus. You have been posted and you hold until relieved. You don't let them teach any other doctrine, including this one that Paul just outlined for him, which was one of the biggest uh, negative influences on that church at the time. So let's answer the question and close. What is sound doctrine? What is it that Timothy was to contend for and to make sure that nobody taught any, uh, not, would, would not teach anything else but sound doctrine? What is it? Paul says in verse 11, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. Well, read the, what, 16 epistles that Paul wrote, and you'll see the gospel of the blessed God that Paul received and he commissioned Timothy with. Sound doctrine is that God has come to us and God is desiring to reconcile us. And that God has provided a way through the cross of Jesus Christ to reconcile us. Yes, we are sinners. Yes, we deserve to die. But Jesus, the Holy Son of God, became a man and took on human flesh so that he could die in our place. And he paid the price that I rightly owe. And he paid it in full. And he rose from the dead to prove it. And in triumph over sin and death and the devil, he says to all mankind, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He has completed the work. You say, well, that means we're just supposed to be fat, dumb, and happy and sit back in our rocking chairs and wait for the second coming? Oh, no. That means we come to him and he transforms us and he fills us with the zeal of the Lord of hosts. He fills us with a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. He fills us with the love of God. And we walk with him and we talk with him and we go to the world and we tell them about him. And that's part of this wonderful good news that Paul had. That's sound doctrine. Don't chase after those isms. Don't be taken in by those who teach. And don't let them come into the church, Paul said. One question for you. Are you a legalist? Do you think that by your good works you can somehow earn God's favor? Or maybe you're just a hopeless person to say, well... Preacher, I'm a mess. I don't, you know, I, 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 don't see, I don't see how I can overcome my selfishness. I don't see how I can overcome my sinfulness. I'm a lost cause, man. I don't, think, I don't think God can save me. I want you to know that I lost some sleep several nights during 1972 and 1973 thinking, there's no hope for me. I'm reading the Bible. I'm trying to do good. And I'm just as bad as I ever was. Maybe worse. But Paul says, sound doctrine has the good news that no, God knows who you are and God knows where you are and God loves you just as you are. But he can change you. We're going to learn tonight of how the great God created the heavens and the earth. Man, if he can make Jupiter and Mars and the sun and the asteroids and the galaxies that spin out there in the vastness of space. I believe God could change this little old messed up soul of mine. But I got to let him. I got to put myself in his hand. What you believe will make all the difference.
Hear this. Preacher, what do I need to believe? Believe that God is knocking on the door to your heart. If you feel like a sinner, it's because God has shown you the x-ray and he's saying to you, yep, you're broken. But I'm the one that can fix you totally and for eternity. What you need to believe is that when the Son of God came down from heaven and died on the cross, he died for your sins. He took your sins into the grave and he rose victorious over the grave. And just as he rose from the dead, he can raise you to walk in newness of life. That's what you need to believe. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except by me. The, what you need to believe is what Jesus said. He proved it was true, but you have to personally put your trust in that.